Segu, ka txokku. Vot kuna varadust si kiisa uni sarate, et eza vot kan isa aana kiine ka txokjaak, et nene kan jaka haga jõngu ahutsa. Kas itse agu sõnõi juhtsad, et tõnu oge nähtu, kan jaka haga kena tood, et tõnu ka näsa taa kena kena kere. Aadu, et ka tahsa va. Aga ka tõhun zooni, et see tahtsid tõnu varadu nene, aga ega nene ka saad stassara saa oie ära tõnu, aga ega teda oan ära. Tõi avandu oja saa võni saa raade jõngu anna kere, nega ei tea nii staan hõnsa. So, I am... It's important for me as a Ganyakahaga person, a turtle clan, to begin in my language, especially on our territory. And uh, I appreciate um, the invitation to come here and speak with you today. Uh, the history of Canada is really not well known. It's still not being told. In fact, I think um, when I was going to high school in the 70s, um, history is still being taught the same way. And as Canada and Montreal mark significant anniversaries in their existence, um, the resistance to talk about the truth is still very much alive. There is not much political will other than the token words that are spoken by the Prime Minister of Canada who claimed that his most important relationship with, was with Indigenous peoples and who also claimed his representatives at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, um, that they would implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so the doctrine of discovery and the papal bulls remains uh, the reason why Canada has declared sovereignty on unceded Indigenous Peoples' lands. And as we see an, uh, from an illustration by um, Bartolome de las Casas, uh, the Europeans who came over with Columbus and, and those who uh, ensued killed indigenous people, sometimes for sport, sometimes ate indigenous people, until uh, de las Casas pleaded uh, with his higher-ups that these are people, these are human beings, and that we should not be eating them. And Terranelius, um goes back to the fact that, of course, the indigenous people were not Christians. Of course they couldn't be. They weren't. And, um, and it causes a lot of friction amongst the people who, do, who are Christian of our, of our people, indigenous people, and is what some of the reasons why colonization has been so successful. As Franz Fanon has said, colonization is violent. And its, its violence is evident in how indigenous people have been treated throughout the, these many centuries by the colonizers. And in fact, uh, this functional and the denial and oppression of indigenous people's rights has become the norm. We know that there are romanticized versions of indigenous people. And when you think about indigenous people throughout history, you think of the men with their headdress or bare chested. You never think of the women and the roles that the women have played throughout their centuries of oppression and how they are the backbone of the nations, keeping with them the languages, the culture, those values, those ways, those artistic art forms that have survived through centuries of oppression and who have, you know, imagine your child being ripped from your bosom to attend a school to learn a language that you do not know and nor does your child know. And often those children were never allowed and were punished, in fact, for speaking their language. I have heard horror stories of needles being pushed into the children's tongues, hands held over hot flames, and many other brutal beatings of indigenous children. Children. At the, in a government state-run institution who were kidnapped, sexually and physically abused. And of course, I, I was looking on the internet for many different kinds of historical uh, posters. And I, I thought this one would be interesting to take a look at. And uh, one of my heroes, is, unfortunately this is not him, one of my, one of my heroes is um, Geronimo Sitting Bull. And really unknown woman, 
Jagusaze. And Jagusaze was the first human being that accepted Kayanara which is the great shining peace, which the Iroquois Confederacy have come together under a great pine. And she was the first person who accepted this, this journey that the Ganawida was on to talk about bringing peace to our people who were at war at the time. And her, her, uh, her stipulation was the Ganawida, was I will help you carry on this message of peace if you will also help promote the corn culture, which is why corn is so important to our people. And then the first community of the Ganyagahaga people to accept Kayinarat Goa was my community in Ganasadage. And people will say that we come from the Mohawk Valley, and it's true, there were Iroquois nations living in the Mohawk Valley, but this area, this area has always been occupied and populated by our people. And it is anthropologists and archeologists who promote this lie to Canadians and to the Quebecers, and indeed to the rest of the world, that we, as Tom Sidden, who was Minister of Indian Affairs in 1990, stated we are 17th century immigrants and therefore have no rights on this land. And so Tom Sidden and others like him do not understand how closely tied our ind indigenous identity is to the land. The language and the culture is based upon a relationship with the land. And it is about relationships, right? When you break that relationship, whether it's the family unit that was ruptured because of Indian residential school, or whether it's pipelines and fracking on our lands today, those are ruptures within a relationship that has been developed for centuries. And so in 1990, when, um, when we decided that we would protect the last piece of common land in my community to, from golf course development and uh, um, condominiums. We did so uh, in United as a people, as a community. And I'm gonna be showing you some of those photos because they're not the photos that you would see on the news. You saw different photos in the news. And I was called a radical I was called a radical, and Brian Mulroney, prime minister at that time, said he would prefer to speak to the moderates. And so I'm very proud that I'm not a moderate. And it's interesting, in, in, in English, when you talk about a militant, it's really very different than a milit militant in French. And um, so there you go with the two different kinds of versions, how truth is told. Um, Another one of my heroes is Chief Dan George, who, uh, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't see many, many people who were indigenous. Uh, I grew up, uh, I started my school in uh, two day schools. Um, and of course, my language was not taught. I was taught uh, my language by my parents. Um, my father was trilingual, perfectly trilingual. He could go in and out of French, English, and Ganyagaha very easily. And we were not told about the kinds of things that were done to our people. It was normal to feel oppressed. We didn't know how oppression felt. One of the first things that white children said to, to me and others from my community when we went to school in St. Eustache uh, was, do you live in teepees? Do you have toilets? Do you have running water? And you know, I went to school um, in grade seven, I, I mean, at the age of seven, I went to school in St. Eustache, and this would be around 1966. So um, it was really weird for me to hear this. Um, but in the telling of our stories, uh, as, we, as we got older, we saw some of the most sacred things of this planet. We heard of these horrific stories of bison being killed, and they knew that the bison, the buffalo, were part of the diet for people on the plains, and they just killed them for sport. They just killed them. And so there is, there is the many skulls of the beautiful buffalo. And in our language, we say Tiskeriago. I'm not sure what the Sioux call it, but um, this is part of, part of the history. And so w when we started our, our barricade of a dirt road, it wasn't a highway, we started off with a fishing shack. The fishing shacks that you see nowadays that are on the, in, the, in the rivers. And um, 
the two posts that you see, those two tiny posts, uh, I'm as old as the golf course or the golf, 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 golf course in Oak is as old as I am. In 1959, when they built it, they put these two little posts up to say, because they were disrupting the road that would go into the village, and said that your people can pass through these two posts. We give you permission to go through. And this was a part of the area in our community where berries were picked, medicines were picked, and cattle, local cattle were picked. And if you look at the other picture, this is not a road that you would go on normally, especially if you have a nice car. You would not go on that road. And this is what it looked like in that year that we started. This is a picture from that time period. And uh, this is part of uh, the, the road that we blocked, where the trees, the line of trees are in the back. That's where Highway 344 is. And it's a place where a lot of our, our community gatherings would take place. Picnics, uh, you know, I remember bologna sandwiches and Kool-Aids on, on those, those early days. My grandmother would make a whole bunch, my aunties. Uh, there would be lacrosse games. There would be foot races by children. And uh, it was a lot of fun. So this, um, this is the front of the barricade, and this is one of the many looks that it had. It changed in, in, uh, as it went along. And uh, we put those up because we were being rammed by the Citoyen d'Oka, especially at night. It was mostly women that were manning the banner barricades. And I, like, I like how English uses uh, very gender-specific words. Um, and we were very, very, uh, we're very stubborn people. Kanyokahaga means people of the flint. Now, flint is a stone. Flint is a stone that you make fire with. And when you say aguadir, that means my family, but it also means your fire. And, and so, um, you know, people, people of the flint are extremely, extremely stubborn. You have run the gamut just like any, any people in this world, a very kind people, uh, and people who, whose mind has been turned upside down. We have lots of word for the mind and how it's turned upside down, having a good mind. Let peace be in your mind. Skanes and untunyo. And um, the, the dispute, the land dispute in Ganesadage or Oka, because Oka is Ganesadage, no matter what the Maravoka says, uh, is 300 years old. And the story is that the people came from Montreal, Nipissings, Algonquins, Mohawks, in the dead of winter by the Sulpician priests who were blue bloods from France. They never took an oath to poverty. Uh, they were able to pay for their own army. And they came in the dead of winter and to the community, and the community uh, didn't want, did not want to accept them at first. And they said, well, if you're going to cut a tree, you have to tell us where. And what there was an agreement signed, and long story short, the Sulpicians turned that agreement around so that when a Mohawk cut a tree, they were jailed. And this dispute is still going on. The government today, and this is, this is not a reserve in the true sense of the word, which means the government has been able to chip away at our community and um, take away land that has been traditionally occupied and used by the Ganyakahaga people. And they will, they will say that we cannot tell the province what to do, and we cannot tell the municipality of Oka to do, what to do. And so for, for now, what we're stuck with this year, which could erupt into another um, uncomfortable situation, is 400 homes are slated to be built in what is known as Oka, but is going to Sadaga. And while many people deny that there was a genocide in Canada, they, they like to call it something a little bit more palatable to the Canadian public, uh, genocide. So genocide, the Indian residential school meets the whole criteria of what genocide is. Kidnapping an identifiable group of people with a language, with a land, with a, land, um, with a territory, uh, with a government, kidnapping them oppressing the people. And in genocide, you don't necessarily have to eliminate, extinct those people, right? That's what people don't understand about genocide. They think that you, you have to eliminate the whole group, but no, that's not what happens. Genocide, people will survive. People will be still there. But in what condition the state of their languages or cultures are is another question. In what state their land will be is another question. And so reserves were created to protect the white settlers who kept coming. We never had a say in who was going to come. 
We didn't have those kinds of, of, of policies. They, you, everybody was a human being. And so people kept coming. And so after the War of 1812, and as being allies of the British or whoever, um, and a lot of our, co our communities were decimated because we, we lost a lot of people, including children. What ended up happening is we were put on reserves. And those reserves were where we had to get permission to leave. So in my grandparents' days, the oppression was really bad. Uh, today's generations and those who are involved in Idle No More don't, did not have to live that, but we still are living a different kind of oppression. And so on July 11th, when the Surtits Quebec's uh, paramilitary squad, which included Canadian Army soldiers in it, by the way, um, people started flying the warrior flag. Now, we started in March, and we said, this belongs to the people. We are not flying the warrior flag. We don't want weapons there. We want to have a peaceful barricade. Um, but that was not what happened, because individuals took it upon themselves. And so what happens is the narrative had changed. The narrative changed from women being the leaders in the front. I guess we weren't sexy enough. So they changed it to something totally different that took away our, right, our, human, our humanness. So you had men with masks, men with guns. And they were who the government was really actually wanting to talk to. They didn't want to talk to people like me. They wanted to talk to guys who were in masks, not these kinds of masks. But these were men who were trained to kill. They were trained to fight, unlike the men in my community who just out of passion and out of sheer um, humanity decided that they would take up arms to protect the people. Because this is a community. This is not a house that was surrounded. This was our community, and Ganawaga, which is just over the Mercier Bridge, is also, was also surrounded. And I remember one of the journalists saying to me, when you, there's a gasp that, that the, the government is threatening to use on you so that you're awake, but your, your body is totally paralyzed. What are you going to do? And a lot of people said, well, we're going to stay. What? This is our home. This is our home. And this is how we are treated on our homeland. Concussion grenades um, and different kinds of things were used against us. The women went to the front to meet uh, each, uh, each squad, um, but they didn't, wanna, they didn't wanna talk to us. And this is the whole thing about the marginalization of women. And so the terrorists, for my, for, in my perspective, was the government of Canada, the government of Quebec, the Surtites Quebec, who now, as we know, uh, are abusing women in Val d'Or and are getting away with it. Uh, Human Rights Watch put out a report a couple of years ago saying the RCMP are abusing the women uh, in British Columbia. But it's okay because it's indigenous women, right? We didn't know about the story of murdered and missing indigenous women until three white women went missing on the Highway of Tears in British Columbia. Before that, there were numerous indigenous women going lost. And the police's, uh, the police attitude was, well, they're, they're probably gone to party, right? Because you guys are a bunch of drunks and, Indian, and, and you know you like drugs too, so what are we gonna do? So the use of force was justified through images. And this is the whole thing about propaganda, right? Uh, the famous, the famous uh, photograph that went around the world, both of these actually went around the world, women holding weapons, which was on a day uh, when we thought the army was going to move in on us in early August. And then in September, the two, the standoff. Um, I never held a weapon, and I came almost as close to a Canadian soldier. Many other women never held weapons, but it didn't matter because the Canadian government said that we were terrorists, that we were the terrorists, even though they colluded to defraud us from our lands and our territories for centuries. And so the racist doctrines continue. There has been many, uh, many millions of dollars spent on different kinds of commissions in Canada. Uh, the Standing Committee on uh, the Oka Crisis in 1991, um, which evolved into the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, in which evolved 
and we heard about the testimonials of indigenous people, indigenous survivors of Indian residential school, which evolved into the court ordered apology. This was not out of the good gracious, uh, graciousness of Stephen Harper's heart. This was a legal settlement for heinous acts committed by people who were supposed to take care of children. And from there, from the Indian Residential School apology came compensation for the survivors. And, these are, and there are hundreds and thousands of people like my, my grandmother who went to Shinwalk Residential School who, never, who passed away in 65, who never got to hear that apology, never got to feel validated as a child for the abuses that they suffered. I remember going over to her house, um, and like I said, I, I was five years old when she died. But I remember going over to her house, and I don't know how many of you would have the same experience. We would have, uh, sometimes for uh, a treat, um, bread with butter and brown sugar, um, and different little, little things like that, and Crisco on a cracker. Because in residential school, they loaded them up on fat. They loaded them up on lard, because they were malnourished. And so when they came home, they continued this kind of diet. And so this is the kinds of stories that we're seeing, that we are being used, we are being commodified, and continue to be mod commodified, because there still exists a huge Aboriginal industry out there that does not benefit the communities. In this year's budget that was announced, millions and millions of dollars for Indigenous people. But how many of you know that about 61% of that money that's supposed to be targeted for indigenous peoples and the so-called reconciliation actually goes to the bureaucracy of the government of Canada. So every province and every territory has a regional office of Indian and Northern Affairs Canada. And then you have the federal government, Indian and Northern Affairs Canada and their branches of health, education, social services, and they employ people. And so there's over like 450 people in Justice Canada alone working against Indigenous people's human rights. Cindy Blackstock has had to endure years and years of frustration from the government of Canada. This government who claims to be in this era of reconciliation but is still denying Indigenous children the right and support that other Canadian children or other children in Canada have when their families are in crisis. They're still fighting that. And so what is told to you is really nice flowery speeches because at the end of the day, nobody really, really is interested in learning what is actually going on on the reserves and in indigenous communities. They talk about the urban Aboriginal people. There's more people in the urban area than there are on reserves. But anybody can self-identify as an indigenous person. Anybody. So I have, you know, heard people who, from the 1700s, they had a great, 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 great grandmother who was Algonquin or Mohawk or something. And they can self-identify as an indigenous person. And in our culture, you're supposed to be contributing back. You know, you're supposed to be giving back to those institutions. And you're supposed to be talking about, you know, upholding and uplifting those institutions. And it's pretty, pretty hard when you're, you're, there's a suppression of your rights to self-determination. And our, and, and our version of sovereignty is not necessarily the same of the version of sovereignty that Canada or the United States has. Our sovereignty is, again, about building those relationships about respecting the roles of women and the authority of women. In Iroquois culture, when war is declared, it's declared by the women. The women declare the war, and they have a war chief that works for them. And that war chief is to make sure that everything goes as the women want it to be. And today, with colonialism's impact upon our society, we see that there's an imbalance, even in the traditional culture. Because even though we had a residential school apology, even though certain people were compensated, all of our institutions and the pillars of indigenous identity have been damaged. And it's going to take many generations, not money, but, but goodwill, good faith, to restore those wonderful and, and rich cultures 
that were vibrant over two, three hundred years ago. It's estimated that after the first century of contact with Europeans, three quarters of the indigenous population were killed. Imagine all the traditional knowledge that we lost. And the words that we have today in our languages have that traditional knowledge. There is embedded, it's there, it's, 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 for, it's for this, um, this generation to have. How many of you remember seeing the, the, the effigies burnt nightly at Sharege? How many, of know, how, how many of you know this story? Put your hand way up. I want to see them. So it looks like less than half. The government, when this was going on, said nothing. They justified it by saying, well, there's inconvenienced motorists. And they're not allowed to use the Mercier Bridge because it might explode. There was dynamite on the bridge. So rather than look at us as human beings, and at this time, at the same time, thousands of human rights are being abused by the Certitz Quebec and the Canadian Army, the most important thing for government of Canada and Quebec was those, the mobs at Chattagui, because you are their constituents. You vote for them. We don't vote. And the abuses, the human rights abuses, the beatings of the men, the Mohawk men and their allies remain unanswered to this day. Um, and all of this is about land. All of this is about economics. It's always been about economics and enriching the monarchs in Europe, enriching the people uh, who came here and their descendants. And indigenous people have been denied that right to self-determination, for our languages to flourish, for us to be able to pick our medicines without fear of contamination. The five First Nations that live around the tar sands have experienced uh, devastating health problems, equated to those who would work with oil on oil rigs, cancers, the moose they eat, the deer, the fish, and the tailing ponds in which ducks also die, but the tailing ponds will take centuries before those tiny gr granules uh, of bitumen settle to the bottom of a glass. So we, we are in trouble. We're in trouble as a human race. We're in trouble as, um, as a species that, that is kind of like a flea on a dog. That's the best way to, to, to describe us as as a species, because we do not, um, we don't understand that the quality of life is not just about making the most money. A quality of life is also about the air you breathe. It's about having a clean environment. It's also doing, taking what you needed. You know, Bombardier was in the news recently because they gave thirty million dollars of bonuses while taking government subsidies. Something is wrong with this system. Something is wrong, and it's been wrong for centuries, and nobody has done anything about it except this is a democracy that Canada understands. Um, you all, you've all heard of Donald Trump, right? right? A fascist. A fascist was elected. And I wanted to, and I, I was speaking to some of my um, Quebecois friends, and I said, you know, this is what we are living, we have been living under. You understand a little bit now of what indigenous people have been going through. Because what he represents is the colonizer at its epitome. He represents the stupidity and the inhumanity that we as indigenous people have experienced for a long, long time. And nobody understands what colonization is and what colonialism is. This is colonialism. When people from Ganawage exited because they were afraid there was going to be a big massacre, the RCMP and the Sutsits Quebec stood by and watched people throw rocks, and one man was killed from Ganawage. But it didn't make the news. 
Heaven forbid that we, we, you know, the government of Canada and its authorities are wrong. And then we had the Grandmother's March across Canada. Did anyone know that in 1990, the grandmothers were marching across Canada? And they were coming to bring peace. They wanted peace. Just like today when we hear talks of reconciliation and people saying we want peace, we're going to have a new relationship. But we're still waiting. They were still denied that, that rightful voice to speak. And I put some pictures in because we were talking about description of the land. And at that time, this is the front barricade where I'm sitting. I was 31 years old, 27 years ago. And um, you can see the Sûreté de Québec cars, which they gifted us on July 11th. They just left their vehicles behind with the keys in it. They ran down the hill, peeing their pants. Um, Unfortunately, an officer was killed, which we still insist was killed by one of their side. And so we went back later to see the bullet holes that were in there. And this is what it looked like at the end. This is what the barricade looked like. Today, development continues. And um, there seems to be no end in sight. Uh, in the destruction of our lands. You can see the pines on uh, the bottom picture on this side. You can see the pines, how close they are to the pines. And still we are being told, we're sorry your ancestors sold your land. Tough luck, but we're building. It's a very frustrating situation to be in because the land is something that comes from our creation story. In the creation story, the first two human beings on this earth, in fact, the first human being on this earth was a woman. The second human being on this earth was a woman, her daughter. And her daughter had twins. And that's why the role of the women is so important in Iroquois culture. That's why it's still so important to keep on telling those stories, that stories from the beginning. And some will say that some are myths, some are legends, you know, and, um, and looking at indigenous people, oh, that's their folklore. Yet there is the leader of the free country and all the people he represents believe in an ark that was built where two by two animals were put on this ark and that Moses divided the Red Sea. But, but we're the ones who are superstitious. We're the ones who you know, believe in folklore. And this is why I mean that when we talk about truth or the real facts, as Donald Trump likes to call them, we need to have that critical thinking. And are we teaching that in the schools? The former Auditor General of Canada, Sheila Frazier, said that it would take 28 years for the quality of education on reserve schools to catch up to the quality of education that is found in the majority of Canadian schools across Canada. Indigenous children receive less to have access for their languages, perhaps $4 per child, whereas there's almost 3,000 for French and English languages per child. That's reconciliation. This is the norm that we have been forced to accept. This is the norm that indigenous people continue to live under. And we are supposed to be happy with the breadcrumbs that is given to us by the colonizers. Am I, am I good for time? Okay. And I have hope, though, because one of our greatest allies came from the Quebecois people who protested in front of Robert Morass's offices on uh, René Lévesque, who understood what the quest for sovereignty means, and who we still remain contact with as part of our quest to have equality for everyone, for human rights, for the rights of the environment, the rights of Mother Earth and all our relations. Imagine that you cannot eat the fish you cannot eat the animals, you cannot use the medicines because of contamination. 
And why? Because the Environmental Protection Act was gutted a while back in Stephen Harper's omnibus bill. And gutting pieces of legislation continues. And everybody says, let's get rid of the Indian Act. Yeah, for sure, we don't want to have the Indian Act. But what is your government going to follow then? Are you going to give us our land back that you stole? Are you going to give us restitution for things that were taken from us? Are you going to be honest in when you speak to me? Are you going to see us? Or do you only want to see the romanticized version of what you think an indigenous person should look like and behave like? Are you going to support us when we go to those barricades again to protect our lands, to protect those who cannot speak for themselves? Are you going to be with us? Or are you going to be, again, an armchair warrior for the Canadian government who will continue the oppression until indigenous people become the docile creatures that Sir John A. Macdonald wanted us to be? I have many hopes in my lifetime that um, hopefully I will live to at least to be 80 and that I won't have to sit in my rocking chair with a gun, you know, a shotgun in my hand because I'm worried about the state of society. But that the new leaders that are coming up, whether they're politicians or whether they're indigenous leaders, will come together and see human rights as a holistic, in a holistic way. Because when one part of your indigenous rights or one part of your human rights is being violated, you cannot enjoy the rest of your rights. So if you cannot eat healthy foods, that affects you physically. It affects you spiritually. It affects you mentally. And studies have been shown that under too much oppression and too much stress, the actual chemistry of your brain changes. And so when I think about the suicides that I hear up north, I think, wow, what must be going on in their minds? You know, an apathetic government is just as bad as, as a fascist government. Demonizing indigenous peoples all these years has not benefited Canadian society because we are not at peace. One of the most beautiful things that I uh, heard about reconciliation was, um, does anyone know Joan, remember Joan Cardinal Schubert? She, she was an Alberta artist. And she did this wonderful piece on Indian residential school and she had desks with apples on it. And I remember this elder at one of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's conferences actually here in Montreal. And she was describing to me and she says, I can't remember the name of that artist, but you know what it looked like? And I said, yes. And she says, you know, the artists are gonna be the ones to show us the way. They're gonna be the ones to help us heal. And that is my hope that our arts will flourish once again, that our ways of expression will not be smothered because, because society is either too racist, too gender discriminatory, too misogynistic, too homophobic, too whatever. Because that's where we need to nurture. We need to nurture the youth to be able to express themselves and to learn the truth so that when they are expressing themselves, they reflect back the truth. It's extremely important that education be changed. It's not enough for the government of Quebec to say, well, indigenous languages were negatively affected by the Indian residential school, and that's it. It's irresponsible. And it's another form of fascism as far as I'm concerned. Because if you speak out if you speak out either in my communities or if you speak out to government, and I've, been, I've attended a lot of National Assembly meetings or parliamentary committees, when you speak out, you make people uncomfortable. And that's okay. It's okay to be uncomfortable. You're a human being. If you're not uncomfortable, then I'd worry about that. I would really, really worry about you. And in 1994, 
for during the siege or the crisis. It was the first time Canadians heard an Indigenous person saying, we are not Canadian citizens. And I swear that the journalists who were standing in front of me when I said that almost fell off their feet. What are you talking about? What do you mean you're not Canadian? Of course you're Canadian. Where were you born? Where were you born? They're like, you know, I was born in a hospital in Montreal, the Royal Victoria. Yeah, but you're, you're born here in Canada. Yes, but we never gave up our citizenship to the Iroquois Confederacy. It's imposed citizenship, just like status is imposed. And so when we talk about reconciliation, we need to acknowledge at the fact that we have a right to our own nationality as we choose. We shouldn't have to just live in those tiny postage stamp sized pieces of land that the government supposedly reserved for us to feel that we belong to the land. This is our land too. And we want to be able to, to live in harmony with others. But I can tell you, we cannot do it unless every single person in this room and every single person who lives on this continent gets up and speaks out against the fascism that is occurring in Canada and in the US, against Quebec. Because we can't do it alone. Silence means that you condone that kind of behavior in your politicians. Policies and legislation are supposed to be about helping people. Canada has numerous international human rights instruments that it is obliged to. People try to say that, you know, I think there was an article that came out recently that Justin Trudeau said, you know, Indigenous people do not have a right to veto any kind of development. Because before the election, he was against pipelines. And when Donald Trump got in, it was like, oh my God, oh yes, now I have to approve the pipeline, so yes. Indigenous people, you cannot veto development. The Declaration has nothing about veto. It talks about free, prior, and informed consent. And it, if it does serious damages to us and our health and well-being, then we have a right to say no. And, and that's, that's what I think is an alternative truth that he's saying to Canadians, to again demonize indigenous people who are against um, the dinosaur-like fossil fuel. And we all need, we're all reliant on gas and oil. But I, I really want to, I really want to emphasize that if we are going to continue to pretend to hold hands, let's at least do it honestly. Let's at least bring about that kind of truth to history and, and not listen to the propaganda. We are not conquered people. We experience genocide at one of the most heinous levels that was accepted by Canadian society. We are not conquered peoples. I am not a citizen of Canada, but I am a human being. And as Thomas Banyanka said, he was the late Hopi elder who addressed the United Nations many, many times over several decades. And this sort of epitomizes, this quote from him epitomizes the kind of philosophy that many indigenous people have had and have tried to tell the colonizer about. That it's not about power in the sense that you are thinking of. It's not about money, it's not about militarization. It's about the promotion. It's about the, the, the health and welfare of human beings who think, you know, we think that we're the top, but we're not, we are part of it. It's about promotion and the health of the health and well-being of the fish, of the plants of the four-legged ones, reptiles, of the air we breathe, which is alive, the waters that we drink and swim and bathe in, and bathe your children in. It's about the rights of them as well, and the birds, 
This is what indi true indigenous philosophy is about. Not this band council system that was imposed upon our, gov on our people, which has been to the benefit of the Canadian government. And while we continue to, to, to try and forge a new relationship, um, I often wonder if it will be in my lifetime. I often wonder what, what, what does it take? We're all very, very good at crisis, right? A hurricane devastates a community. There's famine in a part of the world. Someone has taken over the parliament. People are shot, terrorists taking the lives of people. We are all very good to think about those things and to try and act in our own way. And that's all I ask is to try and act in whatever way you are comfortable with to make positive change, to bring about the kinds of, kinds of ways where mass violence is a, is a thing of the past. Perhaps in museums we'll see those, but that is a thing of the past. And there is something from uh, the UN that talks about climate change. And climate change, of course, at least in my mind, is extremely real because I can see the changes when we plant. I can see the changes in the maple, the wata. We call it wata. He's the leader of the trees. That we should be giving a choice to this generation of how they want to see future generations be sustained, because those future generations have nothing to do with the mistakes that we are making today. They, need a, they should be allowed the chance to benefit from swimming in the lakes, from eating the kinds of food that makes us healthy, and that we should be also talking about the people who are most vulnerable in our society, and that the most people who are vulnerable are our children, People talk about indigenous women being vulnerable, and yes, we are. But the most vulnerable ones are the children. And the rights to the child is something Canada is expected to uphold. And it's high, most highest attainable standard, not the most minimum standard it can reach. Um, I'm not good with Max here, but... Um, If we're, going to, if we're going to talk about violence, if we're going to talk about changes, um, we need only look at the land that surrounds us to see how much it's crying out for our help. We are entitled to the most beautiful world that we can possibly imagine, not what some corporation thinks we can possibly imagine. Not some promises, some empty promises from politicians. But envisioning the future is part of our ways of doing things, thinking for seven generations, which I've heard so much now that it's become a cliche. But to envision a future where the truth is told, where the truth is part of who you are as an identity of people, because this year, I am not celebrating Canada 150. I'm not celebrating Montreal 375. I'm celebrating the fact that we're still here as indigenous people, as Ogonwe, and that um, I'm, still, I'm still invited to these kinds of talks, in spite of how I talk. Uh, it's a great pleasure. It's a great honor. Thank you, Francois, uh, for uh, inviting me. Uh, thank you to, to this museum for, uh, for its generous amount of time that is, is given to me and all, the, all of you who are here, hopefully to envision a better future, a beautiful future that we can go ahead together and work and, um, and be part of. So, Nyokoa Tanikawanagan.